Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on nudging the nudges. And thank you all for coming. I'm sure this is going to be a really exciting session. So we have an hour and a half today, and we're going to have a rather large panel. Uh, so just uh, to cover them off, we'll have Baron as our first speaker, and he will speak for about half an hour with a few minutes for questions. Our next speaker will be David Halpin, and he has about 15 minutes. And then I'll bring the rest of the panel up to the stage, and then we can hopefully have a really great and informed discussion. So first of all, what is this session about? Now, to start with, my name is Heather Koching, and I manage the behavioural science team in BETA. And we are the team that is responsible for understanding and trying to figure out which particular behavioural biases are present in any particular policy problem. And the thing that seems increasingly obvious to us, two things really. First of all, we are no less uh, biased than anyone else. And even in our own work, you partly have this problem where now you know all your own biases, but it doesn't make you any less inclined to overcome them. And the second thing that seems obvious is whatever we're doing, we can feel the way that we're doing it is also prone to bias. So the conversations we have, the decision making that we use, in public administration, it seems like there are lots of uh, potential biases to overcome and lots of interesting ways we could actually start to think about that. And part of the reason that's so interesting and compelling is because to go beyond a kind of individual trial level of thinking about a bias and think about the system of government and the types of kind of decision makings and processes and administrative kind of infrastructure that is in place and the risk or potential that bias might be playing in some of those things feel like, you know, we could have this uh, kind of compounding effect on the biases in public administration and how they could actually be influencing public policy. So I want to give you a little story about my own experience in thinking about some of the biases of public servants. And this came from a, a previous job I was in where I had a staff member who, frankly, he took a lot of sick days. And um, at some point, you don't know this unless you're a manager, you appear on a, a list of people with high sick leave days and managers get these reports every so often that tell you how many sick days your staff have been taking. And so I had to have a conversation with him that said, look, you're actually approaching a high amount of sick leave. Do we need to have a conversation about your health? Um, and also just a conversation about uh, whether or not those were genuine sick days, basically. And the thing that I realised was I knew how many sick days he'd taken, but he did not. And the reason he didn't know is because, and many of you, if you're in government, will have a similar system. When you go in to take a sick leave day, it tells me how many days remaining. It doesn't tell me how many I've used. So the managers get this information about how many sick days a person is taking, but that information is not actually salient to the individual. Now, this person uh, had taken 40 sick days in a year, which is six weeks' worth of sick leave. So that's a really high amount. But even if you know that you've been quite unwell, you're probably not keeping an exact mental log of every sick day you took and how they were adding up. The other thing which is really interesting is you don't know how that compares to the norm. So there's no social norming where you ask all of your colleagues and friends to count up how many days they're using. And in order to find out what the Australian Public Service average is for sick days, I had to go to the Australian Public Service Commission website, I had to put it into their search engine, I had to go about four links down, I had to find a report to discover it's 11.5 days. So this means this information is not salient either. So there's these two things, both the amount of sick days you're taking and the actual average that are not salient. And this made me think, this is just this tiny little example. Imagine when you scale this up and think about all the kind of biases and decision making at a broader scale that the public service might actually be experiencing. So I'm thrilled that we're going to discover a lot more about this in this session, and now I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So Varun Gowri is the Senior Economist in the Development Economics Vice Presidency of the World Bank. He co-leads the Mind, Behaviour and Development Unit, which integrates behavioural science into the design of anti-poverty policies worldwide. He was co-director of the World Development Report 2015, Mind, Society and Behaviour. Varun serves on the editorial boards of the journals Behavioural Public Policy and Health and Human Rights and is a member of the World Economic Forum Council on Behaviour 
the Advisory Board on Academic Stand Against Poverty and the Board of the Behavioural Economics Action Research Centre at the University of Toronto. And the World Bank has been doing super interesting work in this space, so please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Sorry? Okay, great, thank you. Thanks so much, Heather, for that warm introduction. It's great to be back among friends here at uh, BX and great to be back in the beautiful city of Sydney. Um, in his foreword to his landmark book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman wrote that the reason that his biases and heuristics program caught on outside of his core discipline of cognitive psychology, in his view, was that he and Amos Tversky would include in their papers the actual questions that they gave to respondents. That way readers could experience for themselves their own thought process and their awareness of how they might too be tempted to give an answer that was incorrect or be susceptible to a bias. I think the same thing is true of policymakers. If you give policymakers the opportunity to think through and experience the kinds of biases that they might have, they become aware or can become aware of the universal tendency that people have to think with heuristics and biases and become more um, favorably disposed to a policy program that addresses these things. That's certainly been our experience in the World Bank. In the World Development Report 2015, we had a chapter that um, described the bi results of a survey of World Bank staff and showed that World Bank staff are just as biased as any other people in the world. And that survey played an important role in generating support for our policy initiatives that followed from it. I presented the results of that survey to our president and to the board, and they were fine. They were happy to hear, or really maybe relieved to hear that they also were biased. Um, in the background, of course, for us was uh, the fear of a headline that was something along the lines of World Bank says poor people are biased and not very good at solving problems. Um, and including this was sort of inoculating ourselves against a, a headline like that. After we published that report um, with some colleagues, I've gone forward with uh, Stefan Durkin at Oxford, Chair Benuri at Edis Anglia, and reanalyzed the data. We replicated some of the work with a sample of UK civil servants in, in DFID, um, and I want to share the results of those with you. At the same time, I know that there's interest in doing similar kinds of work, and we have lots of thoughts, like all people do, about what we could have done better, some of the biases are, we ourselves made in, in doing the study, so I'd be happy to, to talk about that as well. Um, I'm going to... Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, what I want to share with you to start with are the, are the results of that survey, which is a survey of, of um, World Bank staff, as well as um, civil servants in DFID. Um, 2,000 in the World Bank, about a little bit over 1,000 in DFID. Um, what we tried to do was to um, replicate some of the classic biases found in the literature, Confirmation bias, which is the tendency to um, seek out evidence that confirms your prior views and filter out the evidence that, that is inconsistent with those prior views. Gain and loss framing, which is a classic uh, Tversky and Kahneman result, which is that we act differently in terms of our preference for risk when we're in a gain frame versus a loss frame. When things are looking good, we're sort of risk averse. When we're uh, things are bad, or we're in the loss frame, we, be, we become more risk-seeking. Sunk cost bias, which is the tendency to throw good money after bad, uh, to sort of think that what's happened in the past really should or does affect the choices you make in the future. Uh, Risk-taking for self and others. Um, uh, just to preview this, you know, the, the, the standard finding in the literature is that when you play with someone else's money, with house money, you're more risk-seeking. After all, it's not you, right? It's not your money. And you'd think you'd observe this at work, but we end up finding the opposite, that when people are taking gambles for the organization, they're actually uh, more risk averse, which I think is a, is a major problem for many of our organizations. 
And finally, mental models of poverty, how we think about uh, what poverty is and uh, how we think about um, poor people and how we understand their mindsets. So confirmation bias and anti-poverty policies is the first bias. And this, um, we had a striking reason to come back to this work recently. In January, our own World Bank chief economist uh, went to the press and charged that the World Bank's doing business indicators, which uh, describe the ease of doing business and starting a business around the world, uh, were flawed and possibly politically motivated. The evidence uh, that he presented was a, a chart like this. This is in Chile. You can see, just looking at the post-2014 period in particular, you know, the orange was the indicators as published, and they went down under uh, Bachelet, and sort of, at, but after they were tweaked with a new methodology and a new sample of countries, um, I'm not sure what happened there, um, that um, uh, they weren't as bad for, um, for uh, Bachelet and actually good under Pinera. And systematically, uh, what was published um, and under the uh, new methodology made Bachelet look worse and Pinera look better. Similarly, in India, um, the orange indicators looked like um, they were, in fact, uh, India improved quite a bit after the BJP party came to power in 2014. Um, uh, using the um, consistent methodology, you wouldn't have seen that big increase. So there, were, there was an allegation that uh, the doing business indicators were, weren't appropriate, weren't done appropriately, um, and that in fact the new methodology was problematic. Um, so this was really a, a charge of confirmation bias. Um, it may have been a bias about evidence about what constitutes confirmation bias. Uh, we're not, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's unclear. Uh, the World Bank is actually conducting an audit and will be publishing the results of this audit on July 1. Um, to sort of uh, to respond to these uh, charges by a former chief economist. So this is why confirmation bias is important. Uh, organizations like ours publish indicators and um, uh, recommendations that are important for many countries around the world. And we have to, you, we want to believe that they're based on um, truth or defensible assumptions and defensible and, and, and good data. To understand this in our survey, going back with World Bank staff and to make it vivid, um, we did a between subject design with our sample of 2,000 World Bank staff. And we used work that was first developed by Dan Kahan at Yale Law School, in which subjects are given um, the opportunity to evaluate a study. This was done online. Um, basically, you were, respondents were, um, subjects were given this two by two table and were asked, does a skin cream, is a skin cream effective? Does it eliminate rash, right? And um, any quick guesses? I've done this, you know, I worked on this myself and myself, I sort of still get turned around on this, so it wasn't easy to do. Uh, but, if you had, but if you had a lot of time, you'd come up with something like this, right? Um, if you used skin cream, um, 75 got better out of a total of 75 plus 223. So 25% got better. If you didn't use skin cream, 21 got better out of the total, and that's 16%. So on balance, the skin cream works. That's, that's the, there is a right answer, and respondents were asked to give us the right answer. Then we flipped around, just like Kahan did, flipped around the columns um, uh, of in, in rash got worse and rash got better. Oh, sorry. So 72% of bank staff got the right answer when we, when we gave it to them. Um, now we flipped around the columns, and you get a different conclusion. You take the use skin cream is 223 out of the total, which is 75%. Did not use skin cream is 107 out of the total, which is 84%. So in this case, it looks like the skin cream didn't work. World Bank staff, 58% uh, got the right answer in, in this framing. And then we use the same two by two table, but change the framing. It's not gonna be about whether skin cream is, a, is effective, but it's about whether the minimum wage raises or lower, lowers poverty rates, right? Um, the minimum wage is highly contested, highly politicized within economics. Uh, on the one side, people will argue that the minimum wage is you know, helps people because they obviously earn more. Other people argue that it's bad for business. You know, business formation is low, hiring drops, and actually people are, get worse off. Skin cream is not ideological, at least usually for the, for the most part. So in the economics frame, good outcome, you, the respondents saw something like this. And remember, one quarter of all respondents are seeing each of the four, each of the four frames. It's a between subject design. Um, with the minimum wage framing, 41% got the answer right. 
Um, and then we flipped it around, economics frame, bad outcome. And what we found is that 48% got the right answer right. So the bottom line finding here is that World Bank staff were more likely to get the right answer when it was about skin cream than when it was about the minimum wage and poverty, even though many of, the, many of us are trained on minimum wage and poverty and things like that. But that's not the right answer, really. It's not that we're more likely to get the answer wrong even though we're trained on this. We got the right answer wrong because we're trained on this, right? We had strong, this is the, the, the assumption. We have priors in our mind, and that leads us to interpret evidence in, in, you know, in, in a certain way. Now, an additional piece of evidence is that we asked the respondents for their preference for inequality based on the World Values Survey uh, question, which is, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you favor wage, um, uh, how important is equality? Um, one meaning, or this is backwards, how much do you prefer inequality? One meaning you think that wages should be really equal. Ten meaning you think they should be unequal because that's what motivates effort. Uh, that's what gives people a reason to work hard. And what you find is that, and this is the percent of people who gave the right answer. If you look at the left graph, the more that you, this is when um, minimum wage is um, good, um, you're more likely to get the right answer when the numbers are low. That's a slightly downward sloping line. So that people who really prefer wage equality were more, more likely to get the answer right in, in the minimum wage good frame. Conversely, uh, there's a little bit of an outlier at nine, but you see a slightly upward sloping, sloping line on the right side. So again, people's priors are motivating the answer for, uh, in the bad framing as well. So this is prima facie evidence of um, confirmation bias that we found among World Bank staff. Uh, again, we replicated it um, with uh, DFID staff and found almost identical data. So confirmation bias, just to summarize, we find more errors about minimum wage. The errors correlate with political views. And this is even absent the sort of social pressures that you have to sort of answer a certain thing in real life. This was people sitting at the computer screen answering questions by themselves. So this is confirmation bias. But you can ask, what is the mechanism underlying this, right? And I think that's important, right? And you can think of a f at least you know, a few different versions. One is um, people just aren't motivated to work that hard, and they just um, um, don't have a, and they don't have a particularly strong uh, identity on this. They just think, well, I read some papers about minimum wage, kind of what I think, you know, I'm done. You know, it's sort of like a version of laziness. And if you think that's the answer, you can actually quick use an incentive. An incentive would work, right? You could sort of say, I'm going to sort of pay you to get the right answer if it's sort of laziness. And some work by David Rand and co-authors at Yale actually find that you know, incentives are one route to overcome this version of confirmation bias. On the other hand, you can imagine that it's sort of like people don't want to look all that hard because they really care about the answer. They don't want to see something that's wrong. I'd imagine a question on something really contested, say abortion rights or something like that. Um, if you, uh, people think, I don't want to go into that. I don't want to know. I don't want to, I, there's no amount of data that's going to change my mind. Then if you offer someone incentive, it could backfire because you, you could actually make them angry. Uh, there's some interesting work by Jeremy Gingas at the New School um, uh, and others, um, and they find that you know, in, in, in Palestine and Israel, people who have really strongly held moral views, when given an incentive to, to, to think differently, get angrier and get further entrenched. So the mechanism behind the confirmation bias is important because it affects the policy response of the organization. And then you can imagine another scenario in which people actually have, it's not, it's not like they don't want to know, they actually do the work. They sort of do that two by two calculation and they sort of you know, try and find some answer, but then there's still some confirmation bias. And you can imagine one in which you know, they have sort of have a strong identity which is keeping them from understanding what's going on. You know, they're like, okay, I did the calculation, but I'm not going to go there. I don't know exactly why, but I'm just not going to not going to go there. And it's sort of like sort of half unconscious, you know, for something like that. Um, so it's sort of like high effort, um, strong identity, but sort of unconscious. For that, you know, red teaming, you know, what sort of like war games, that kind of thing, could actually help because people can sort of say, okay, other people are arguing, and you sort of overcome these unconscious biases. Another one is high effort, high identity, conscious. Right? These are people who are like, I know what you're trying to get me to think, and I'm not going to answer that. Right? Um, and that's a phenomenon, too. Uh, and for that, I don't know what to do. I mean, don't, don't hire those people, <laughs> is, uh, at least in these kinds of organizations. Um, uh, very careful 
peer review or something like that is very important. You know, there are people like that too, of course, and this is, you know, Dan Kahan and his work, one of his framings is about climate change. And his basic, one of his basic findings is that, you know, among Republicans in his data, the more educated you are, the more resistant you are to the evidence on climate change. So he thinks it's a strategic calculation. You know, they sort of like people prioritize their, tri their tribal, their, their party identity, um, and then they sort of say, yeah, I'm not gonna go there, I know what you're trying to do. Right, so that's, that's a whole different kind of confirmation bias. So we've presented evidence on the existence of confirmation bias, but the mechanisms could be quite different, and that has, that has implications for the actual um, policy response that you put in place in an organization. Uh, framing bias in health policy. So here we, um, this was, we did this in 2014-15. This was during the time of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It was a big deal for, obviously, the people there and also for our organization at the World Bank. We had a lot of focus on, on the problem. Um, it was in the news everywhere um, at this time. Uh, lots of people weren't investing and traveling to Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, you know, billions of dollars of lost um, revenue uh, and trade in those countries at the time. Um, in our World Development Report, our president, uh, in his foreword, wrote Ebola is a terrible disease. Um, sometimes quarantines are necessary. At the same time, it's clear that the behavioral responses we're seeing are partly driven by stigma, inaccurate understanding of disease transmission, exaggerated panic, and other biases and cognitive illusions. You also see this with HIV AIDS and SARS and H1N1 influenza. So it's something that, you know, diseases make people scared. So we used um, the Kahneman-Tversky, they, they called it the Asian disease problem uh, when, they, when they first did it. We didn't call it the African disease. We were, didn't wanna, you know, these days we don't use those labels and just say the disease. Um, and pe so this was sort of a between subject design again. And people were told that their country is preparing for a disease that's gonna affect 12,000 people. There are two potential treatments that are scientifically validated. In one, 4,000 people will be saved. And the other, a one-third probability that 12,000 will be saved. And two, there's probability that no one will be saved. Between those two treatments, of course, it's the same expected outcome. You know, expectation, they're the same, but one is, there, one is a risky outcome and one is not. Uh, that's the safe policy, that's the risky policy. What we find is that um, uh, people choosing the risky policy in the gain frame was 22%. Um, then you switch it around and say, it's not that 4,000 out of the 12 will be saved, but 8,000 of the 12 will die. It's the equivalent, of course, right? Um, and then you, to have, you know, have it also have a risky version of it, which one in probabilities and one that, that's not. And what we find is that in the loss frame, 65% of the people are, are risk-seeking. This is almost exactly the same numbers as the original uh, Kahneman-Tversky result. Um, in DFID, again, very similar numbers. This is quite striking. Um, you know, in their original work, in our organization, in DFID, very similar data. Um, and I think this is really a powerful story about the way that people uh, think about risk and the way that risk is presented to people, the way that risk is presented. Um, so people are more risk-seeking in the loss frame, nearly identical to the kahneman tversky result, and this may explain the Ebola response in the sense that when you are thinking about investing in Guinea or Sierra Leone or you know, another country in West Africa or Liberia, um, you're kind of in the gain frame, right? You don't have Ebola right now. It's so and that you're willing to pay a lot of money in terms of lost investment, lost trade, to avoid that risk. Um, and so we really think this may have been, had a, a large role, uh, this, this played a large role in explaining some of the phenomenon that occurred. So I won't say too much on the other biases for the interest of time. I've got some other things I wanna talk about in terms of bi including bias mitigation, but just to summarize the results. In the sunk cost bias story, uh, people were asked um, how, uh, you know, that there's a project is ending, you know, more the project has been dispersed. The basic finding is that the more that's been dispersed in the past, the more likely people are to disperse in the future, even though that's throwing good money after bad. And people think that their um, colleagues are even more likely to do this than they are, right? So that we're, I'm, yeah, I'll do this, but they, they will really do it. So this is, this is consistent with the idea of a social norm uh, guiding behavior. Um, risk taking for self and others, as I mentioned, people were more risk taking for themselves than for the organization, which is really quite striking, right? Because that's sort of, as, as I mentioned, house money. And I think, generally speaking, the, the risk aversion in organizations and large organizations is, is a big problem. Uh, we, we, we don't really know how to distinguish good failure from bad failure. Um, and we need to take steps on that dimension to get people to, you know, to try new things, to sort of be innovative. Then finally, mental models of poverty. 
We asked World Bank staff, um, for instance, how many poor people in Kenya will agree with the statement, and not in Nairobi, will agree with the statement that vaccines are risky because they can cause sterilization. World Bank staff estimated that 40% of pe poor people in Nairobi would agree with that. Then we went to Nairobi, did a household survey, and found 10% agreed with that. So we have lots of data, our, our organization, on poverty around the world. We produce the, you know, the dollar a day, two dollars a day. We, we, we are the data center, but we don't, have, we don't have data on the mental mindset of poverty, right? And that's something important. Similarly, we asked World Bank staff, you know, how many uh, people feel like the, your life is not in your control if you're poor? And World Bank staff overestimated the feeling of helplessness that poor people in fact have. So this is, um, I think, a, a big agenda is to sort of think through you know, the, the cognitive impact of being poor and, and getting people to understand what it's like, you know, to sort of be in that, to be in that position. So bias and mitigation, um, demonstrating biases is fine, but what do you do about them? Some remedies, one is dog fooding. Uh, this is a Silicon Valley term, where you sort of like try your own dog food if you're a dog food producer. Um, you can imagine uh, when the Obama White House rolled out the, web, the website for the Affordable Care Act, I don't know if you remember this, but it was sort of a disaster at first. If they had sort of tried that more themselves, it might have been helpful. Um, in the mental models of, po in the mental models of poverty um, area, you can imagine that this sort of dog fooding is important. You can actually put yourself in the position of someone who's poor. And the key, I mean, and the, we at the World Bank used to have, you know, sort of village immersion programs and things like that, and that's fine. But sometimes, honestly, you just go there and try some of the local food and learn the dances and you go, right? The, the key thing is to sort of be in the situation of a poor person when they're making a crucial decision, right? That's, that's the key version of dog fooding that I think is important. And UNICEF did some interesting work, I believe it was in Honduras, where people were asked, government officials were asked to actually put themselves in a position of a poor woman signing up for a maternal child health program. They had to um, carry up a 30 pound backpack to simulate being pregnant, up three flights of stores, th uh, three flights of stairs um, to, to sign up, sign up, because that's where that's where the sign up was for the program. That sort of that is sort of like intensive dog fooding. Uh, red teaming, I briefly mentioned. These are sort of war games where you have two sides sort of arguing it out. And this draws on the you know, fairly universal human tendency to like to want to argue. Um, you know, some cognitive psychologists will tell you that you know, the, 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 the evolutionary reason for the existence of reason is not to, not to sort of identify the truth, but to persuade your group that you're right, right? So it's sort of like using that tendency uh, against itself by having two sides argue. And in the case of confirmation bias, where when people are, have unconscious biases, that can be particularly powerful. Uh, better peer review. Um, this is one way to sort of like get around confirmation bias and lots of mistakes. You know, yesterday we heard Cass Sunstein talk about cost-benefit analysis as a disciplining device, and I, you know, one can include that in here too. But that's got to be done well, and you know, and there's lots of ways to sort of like bury your assumptions in a thicket of footnotes that you know aren't you know people people miss. Um, a basic problem with peer review is that people get to choose their peer reviewers. You know, it's sort of why? You know, why do we do this? Uh, we, we know why, right? It makes life easier for us in large organizations, but it's not productive in terms of being an actual screening device, you know, a disciplining device on the quality of work. Stop and think, uh, simple ideas, sort of, you know, just slowing down, you know, getting people to use system two rather than system one. Uh, it's not easy to do because self-nudging is, is, of course, pretty hard. And then there's deliberation, and this is the one that we tested. Uh, um, with 100 diffid economists, much smaller sample, on an annual retreat. In stage one in the morning, respondents took a paper and pencil test, uh, and they received the confirmation bias, minimum wage vignette only, uh, framing bias as before, and in stage two in the afternoon, respondents discussed and answered the questions in pairs. All right? So you have individual answers and answers you give in pairs. Same, same questions. Here's the finding on confirmation bias. Um, the with deliberation, significantly more likely to give a, a good an the right answer with deliberation. It makes sense, right? In this case, there's a right answer, and if you're lazy or whatever, or you're sort of, you know, made a math error, there's someone there to help you. Right? So deliberation can help in the case of confirmation bias, you know, but this is going to be that situation where people may not be expending enough effort, and they don't have a strong identity against the answer. Right? Or, or there's no uniformity of identity within the group. You don't have groupthink in, in that situation. In uh, the, Asian, the, 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 the Asian disease, kind of Tversky vignette, um, what you find is that with deliberation, people are more likely to choose risky policies, but the crucial thing here is the difference between the two, right? The crucial thing for the kind of story is that 
you increase your risk seeking in the loss frame. And here you don't find an effect. 61 minus 42 is very close to 50 minus 33, you know, almost identical. So what's going on here? In his book with Reed Hasty, Cass Sunstein talks about a class of problems called Eureka problems. Eureka problems are problems when, when someone announces the answer, everyone agrees, right? 5 plus 12, 17, we all agree, right? Um, on the other hand, what's the amount, right amount of risk to take in this situation? There's, that's not a Eureka, Eureka problem. That's, and so deliberation might be particularly effective at Eureka problems um, and not necessarily for things like risk, which they don't necessarily have, have a right answer. Um, so let me uh, say a couple words um, about where we are going forward. Um, uh, as I said, I think that this kind of work is really useful in stimulating organizations to begin working on bias reduction within the organizations themselves. One of the things we're working on in the World Bank is that you know, we've committed to the he she goal of um, gender parity, particularly for senior levels, uh, senior management going forward. If we just sort of run through the simulations and sort of you know, think about who we're hiring and how much time it takes to sort of rise up through the organization, we're not gonna be able to, even if we assume 75% of the people we hire are women, uh, we're not gonna hit those gender parity targets by 2022 just because of the amount of time it takes to run up through the organization. So we're beginning to think through what else can we do? You know, uh, what steps can we take? We need to accelerate this. Um, it turns out that applicants to the World Bank are 35% women. You know, which is relatively, you know, you'd sort of want that to be higher. And for senior positions, it's 26% and 29% re respectively. Now, the, the amount of shortlisted candidates is 47% women at the bank and IFC, and hiring is, you know, close to 50%. But somehow getting in that first pool, that's, you know, really the problem, uh, or one of the problems, I should say. So we're working with our HR department to think about, you know, where we source and advertise, the shortlisting process, what biases might, you know, come into play there, and then the selection process um, after shortlisting and interviewing, you know, how are people, how are people selected. Um, on number three on sources and advertising, we're experimenting, this is still at the experimental stage, um, using deep bias language for job advertisements. I know Kate will have a lot to say about this kind of thing. Um, Communicating the need for diversity, just sort of saying, you know, we believe in gender equality and, and you know, in diversity of various sorts. Um, there's some interesting work. Uh, there's one paper, anyway, that says that when you announce the number of people who've applied, that's, that has an effect not only on getting more people to apply, which is almost counterintuitive because you think it's very competitive. Why should I apply? But I guess the social norms part of it, at least in that study, dominates. And you also increase gender, uh, increase the number of women who are applying when you sort of, when you sort of frame it socially or something like that. It's sort of early work, but that's something to think about. Then finally, targeting specific, specific ap applicant profiles, like reaching out to certain, or, certain counterpart organizations to place the job listings who, have, who, have, who uh, can target women. Another area that we're working on is knowledge management, and this is about really sharing, producing and sharing knowledge. And we, have, we have a lot of data in our institution. We don't necessarily use it all. We don't necessarily have incentives to share it, and sort of thinking through that problem about you know how we how we produce knowledge and and, and how we share it. Um, so this is a complicated model of the knowledge production process: creation, acquisition, refinement, then remember that you've refined it, then transfer and sharing, utilization, which then leads to performance. Um, sort of targeting that refinement and memory area. Um, we're, we're, again, this is in the design stage, but we're thinking through you know, some organizational, some process variables, some organizational variables, then some individual variables, and then the ones we're particularly interested in is complexity, you know, sort of simplification and its importance, expectation of reciprocity. I mean, why should you really like, spend time putting together a knowledge product because no one else is doing it? You know, it's, it's sort of a, you know, a free rider problem. And, and then finally, self-efficacy and uh, fear of failure. Um, we've also continued to do some surveys, you know, um, with, on World Bank staff following up from the last survey. We just finished one on the World Bank staff uh, approach to the SDGs, uh, thinking through what, you know, how we think about them, and we'll publish those results in, you know, in a couple months. Um, so just want to wrap up by saying that um, we all have biases. Of course, that's obvious, but I think it's another step to actually demonstrate that, in fact, we have biases, because that opens up the door to... Um, an organizational process in which the, the, you know, the senior management of, a, of an organization can take steps to mitigate bias, but also to take the whole behavioral insights agenda more seriously. Thanks so much. <laughs>
I think we have about five minutes for questions. We have one over here. Cool. Alex Gianni here from the Behavioural Insights team. That was really interesting. Uh, one thing that I think uh, gets levied against psychology quite often is that uh, we use weird studies or weird science, and actually our samples aren't representative. Where it seems like the opening premise of actually this work is that actually if you get weirder, then you're less likely to be subject to these biases. Uh, because if you, you get getting more weirder. Yeah. Because if you're getting more educated, then actually the assumption is that then you're being debiased, but it seems actually it's the opposite is the case. I was wondering whether you're looking at education levels as well and seeing actually whether or not you see that process in action. Yeah. So the question, well, I don't have to repeat it. I guess he had the hand and I come. Um, so I, I don't know that, you know, as you move out to the less weird countries, and for people who don't know the acronym, it's Western Educated Industrialized Rich Democratic, you know, the, the Australia, you know, the US, Europe, the weird countries. Um, as you move out, you become uh, less, bi uh, more biased, I guess was the question. And I don't know that that's true. I mean, we sort of, we're doing this in a number of different countries and don't, I'm not sure why I'm able to say we have systematic results that are different. Um, on the work that we did, we did sort of, you know, break things down, you know, the heterogeneity in terms of education level, economists, non-economists, whether you're based at headquarters and whether you're based in country office. Um, Found some results, you know, that we could talk about, but no, nothing that was like knocked down totally. That's that's the driver. That's the source of the weirdness. Like, like we thought, for instance, being being on this question about whether you were based, um, whether whether a poor person would agree with the statement that vaccines can cause sterilization. We thought that if you're out in the country office, closer to the field, so to speak, you'd be less likely to make that. You'd, be, you'd guess that better. That turned out not to be the case. In fact, people were actually is a little bit worse, you know, in field offices, um, and that's you know that may have to do with I mean, and that we don't I don't know what the answer is, but you can certainly tell a story in which you know uh, certain societies are more hierarchical, and you actually are farther away from poverty if you're living in those societies than, than you are from 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 being um, somewhere else. I, I don't I'm not sure that applies here, but you know you can tell stories like that, so it's not obvious that. Um, uh, I think I think it depends a lot on the particular bias and particular you know question. Thanks, uh, Alex Tkachik, Department of Infrastructure. Um, I was interested in your uh, example there on the bias of your staff in the um, the sun cream and the um, minimum wage example, and. It strikes me that you don't really want people who are non-biased. You want it might be better to ha make sure that you're recruiting people with a diversity of views to balance out the bias. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I think you do want people who are unbiased in the sense that they're when they're asked to interpret a two by two table, they'll interpret the the table in the in an accurate way. You know, I think you don't want people that are totally tabula rasa, right? That have never gone to an economics class and doesn't just just know arithmetic, right? You want people. I mean, economists are asked for their considered view on a variety of policies, on cash transfers, on minimum wage, on you know, interest rates, and you know, financial liberalization, all kinds of things. So you do want considered opinions. You want people to know the literature. But you also want people who can set that aside and say, OK, irrespective of what your prior views are, what does this study say? You know, just interpret this uh, in that way. Um, and I think, you know, generally speaking, in organizations, uh, Sometimes you know the the there is this issue of the principles and, and you know the agents the the principles the policymakers might have a certain view but you still want the agents of those principles to be able to sort of say well here's what I think uh, and there will be situations where irrespective of the global policy the the the, the you know the, those of us working the worker bees in organization will, will have to sort of you know and interpret reinterpret make a country recommendation so I think you do want people who can who can who have that skill. Yeah, Roy Murray Pryor from, well, far north Queensland, I always say. Um, my question is, have you looked at the issue, and you talked about risk aversion of people, have you looked in your own organisation about the risk aversion involved in the selection of projects by the World Bank people? In other words, going towards 
the standard type project as opposed to something that's a bit out of the ordinary. Have you got any studies of that? Um, no, we don't. We didn't do any work on that. I mean, I think um, so. There, I, so there's. I think there's. The short answer is no. I mean, but if I were to do it, I would think about two things. One is the actual riskiness of a project, meaning what's the probability of success, and the other is the extent to which what you're doing is just cutting and pasting from somewhere else. You know, uh, whether you're using quote unquote best practice. Um, and in an organization, we've tried to sort of push away from best practice and toward best fit, you know, to sort of use the slogan, um, because a lot of the policies that work in one place don't necessarily work in another, and there's a tendency to think that, you know, um, there is the right way to approach something, but uh, as Danny Roderick and others have pointed out, you know, in a society, in an economy, what you really have is a set of functions. You know, you need some, you need some, something to guarantee property rights of some sort, it doesn't have to be exactly like a court. You know, you could have a Chinese system of township village enterprises, which had a whole different conception of property rights and triggered you know, the, the largest drop in poverty the world has ever seen. And that, but it was entirely different understanding. So it, there wasn't just a cutting and pasting. It was sort of a, something adapted to the local context. And so that's a somewhat different version of riskiness. It's sort of like sort of uh, understanding the context and tailoring something for it rather than risk of success or failure per se, although people um, can confuse the two. Thank you very much, Varun. And um, I, I thought there'd be a lot covered in that presentation. I'm sure you'll agree there's almost 20 or 30 things that we might have been able to cover, except the thing I will remember is dog fooding as a verb. So <laughs> thank you very much for introducing us to that. OK, so our next speaker I'd like you to introduce you to is David Halpin, who probably needs no introduction, but I'll give you one. Uh, so David Halpin is the Chief Executive of the Behavioural Insights team and Board Director and has led the team since its inception in 2010. Prior to that, David was the Founding Director of the Institute for Government and between 2001 and 2007 was the Chief Analyst at the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. Before entering government, David held tenure at Cambridge and posts at Oxford and Harvard. And the UK BIT team has done some recent new and exciting work from their perspective as well, looking at the behavioural biases of their public administration. So please join me in welcoming David. Are you going to help me so I don't... I'm not too inept. Don't do a pratfall right at the beginning. Um, thanks. Very good. Um, fantastic work Paul Sparrow's been doing for a long time in uh, World Bank and taking it to much wider audiences and places. Um, so, yeah, the background to this is um, we've been thinking maybe nice to do something. It's just 10 years on from Nudge and what would be a nice thing to do. Um, and through the years we've been working, we've got lots of questions always about, well, actually, how does it apply to policymakers ourselves? And as we know, it does apply to us quite a lot. But we hadn't really kind of thought that through. Um, I do think there are lots of, of course, examples of it. In Britain, a um, number of other countries actually, not so different. Um, huge amount of issues, for example, around the Iraq war. Um, massive number of inquiries, huge documents written to understand what exactly happened, how do we go to war, and we thought there were these weapons and they weren't really there, and so on and so on. And it's quite a familiar story, which one way or another you see recurrently across the policy world. It's not a minor matter. And of course, it's been picked apart in enormous detail. So how was it that actually quite weak evidence got turned into or interpreted as very strong evidence, um, and how that kind of built up through the system. And I'll kind of return to that later on, because one of the interesting things actually in the wake of this massive Chilcot report, which took longer to write than the original war took, actually, um, <laughs> that uh, a lot of really quite big structural changes have changed around practice. Um, and I don't think that's only in Britain, but other places too. Um, one thought, I think, um, I know some of this stuff can be a little bit dry sometimes, but I do think we mentioned effectively Height briefly at his work on, um, in, in passing. But it, the, what, what is the voice in your head? I always thought a very striking thing. We sort of know, yeah, we're kind of biased when we make very rapid choices, um, system one, et cetera. But thank goodness for system two, because then rationality kicks in and we get it right. Um, and of course, we know that's not really right um, at all. And I think Height captures it very nicely. He talks about the voice in your head um, you talked about in relation to evolutionary terms, is not a natural scientist weighing out what is true in the world. It really isn't. It is the superb press officer which we carry around in our head, right? So it's there to tell us why the thing we already did 
was just right. That's fantastic. It was a really good decision. No, you were right. You were right. Um, and we see it both in, um, of course, in policy, and we see it in our own lives. So, you know, you're a bit lazy and whatever, and you don't clean up after yourself, and your partner comes in and says, I can't believe you left all that crap again. You know, what's, like, oh, no, I, I had something very important to do because, then fill in the rest, you know, the baby needed something, touch, the dog was going to pee on the floor, I had to do this important bit of work, fill it in very rapidly. But we know it's, actually, if we attend to it carefully, it's bullshit, generally. But we are really good at it. We are so good at coming up with these plausible explanations for why what we already thought was right was indeed right. Motivated reasoning is often known as being. So it's a quite a formidable um, opponent that we're up against, if you like. So by way of background, um, yeah, there was the Mindspace report. We did the Institute even before the 2010 election and BIT was created and various other documents. And we thought, well, maybe a nice time to update that. And then we're about to publish this report in the next few weeks, hopefully, on behavioral insights and government. So re reflect. Um, so there's quite a lot of overlap. So I'm not going to go through all the same material. I just choose a few examples um, from it. And of course, what we're all really interested in is, well, what would you do about it? We're not going to turn us into different kinds of creatures. So our great challenge is to create practices and institutions that handle some of the problems. And others in the panel, like Kate, will talk about it in relation to a specific issue uh, and so on. So that was our challenge. So we'd have a framework a little bit. Um, we haven't turned it into mnemonic, <laughs> unusually for us. But um, it's, you know, what are the kind of process we're seeing going on here? So there are a whole load of things around noticing that Max Bazeman, lots of other people talk about. Um, which come in um, with lots of biases there. There are issues around when we start deliberating and thinking, what should we do? And then there are loads also that come in, well, oh, we think we sorted it all out, we'll go and just do this thing. Um, so we're using that very loose framework. And if you remember those colors, I kind of come back to them in the, in the end. In the policy communities in many countries, we tend to talk about a kind of trilogy, which you can see written across this, which tends to be politics, analysis, delivery, right? The kind of three things we're in the game of doing. And they sort of don't quite correspond, but you know, they loosely map onto this structure. All right, so first of all, what has even come to our attention? Well, strongly influenced. Actually, Cass's original work, for those who are following it for many years, will know this. But this is a simple plot from a, um, a paper a few years ago, which looks at how, much, um, how many deaths do you need to get the same media attention? In this case, it's the same media attention as one death from a volcano. So as you can see, um, actually take quite a lot for most areas, of which the great outlier is famine. So it takes nearly 40,000 deaths to get the same media coverage as one death from a volcano. And lots of questions about why that is, but one thing is, God, volcanoes make great TV, right? <laughs> and they also, right, that is the case, and they also occur quite widely across the world, and there are issues about intentionality that kick into it. Still, kind of important, and that's, of course, partly shaping our politics and our policy. Um, what else can we say? Well, um, one really interesting question, I'll just go back before I flip, is, um, again, it's a UK-centric one, but um, some of you might know that um, we're doing this whole Brexit thing, uh, which I won't comment on in any detail. Um, but um, there are lots of big questions that flow into it. But one of the things there was a big decision early on in the process was whether to lower the voting age. So some of our elections, actually, we have um, 18 or above, and some... Um, actually, in some circumstances, can be to 16. And some countries have moved, Bavaria moved early, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as it happens, we, we know that the young were much, much more in favor of staying in Europe. So if you're interested in these details. But it turns out that actually, for various reasons, there was big discussions, and it was decided in the end, quite a fierce debate, not to lower the voting age for the Brexit, um, which is very, very consequential. But just show you one just simple thing, it just how important it is, depending on when you ask the public and how you word this question. This is not the Brexit question. This is the, should you let those youths vote? Um, so if we'd ask it, you know, do you support or oppose giving 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote? We can see a clear majority in favor. But if actually you ask, do you support or oppose reducing the voting age from 18 to 16. Well, that's a whole nother matter, folks. <laughs> we have a clear majority against. It really matters. It is so consequential. And of course, the answer and the framing of this question itself led to a domino of further consequences, which we are still living with today. Um, in terms of one issue is if this fantastic effect, false consensus effect, known as, but we think, we really do think everybody else is, has similar views to ourselves, getting very consequential. So this is from a range of different issues. Um, and so, you know, do you support or um, not character education in schools, the death penalty, gun control? Um, well, basically, it just depends 
what you are. So uh, opponents, you know, whatever you, whether you're basically an opponent or a supporter, you think other people will have, in general, have similar views to you, right? And we blithely go through the world thinking that's the case. Um, and it's a, it's a very, very powerful uh, effect. Um, all right, I thought I'd always just briefly mention um, this. Uh, Cass also mentioned it. I think it's a really neat result, which is we're biased about our estimate of biases, even, which is very profound. So this is actually from Todd Rogers and others, very recent paper uh, that Cass mentioned. Um, but we also think it's very interesting and profound. So this is to do with just changing an, um, an enrollment arrangement, um, which you remember, those who were paying attention, he sort of said, does this work? Yeah, look. Um, when you've got the auto-enrollment, which is uh, it's basically the fault is set against, so you have to kind of actively do it. We simplify it right down. You kind of make it automatic in terms of the kids' registration. So you get this in, you know, from sort of 1% to 97% in terms of number of kids getting these free school meals, et cetera. But as he mentioned, I just showed you in the number, when you ask school administrators and others, what, did you think, what do you think the effect will be? Look at these numbers, right? So they really think there's not much of a difference between these two things. And as we know, there's absolutely massive difference. And we've seen this time and time again. We saw it on the pensions default changes, where the estimates on both sides of the Atlantic, moving to a um, um, presumed kind of consent or to enrollment, um, well, you know, they were just off by um, you know, 30, 40 percentage points in terms of the effect size. Um, so really consequential. People underestimate the power of nudges, defaults, behavioral effects, because in turn, they don't quite get what's actually driving human behavior. Um, last thing I just thought I'd mention, there are, of course, fantastic examples also around institutional failure. Um, uh, we have some discussion as to whether to do this was too provocative for the economists amongst us. But um, we have had a few recent events, like 2008, et cetera, where there's been, you know, like IMF or whatever, not like World Bank where everybody gets spot on, you know, um, a thousand of the world's best economists all gathered together, and like, oops, missed this sort of event of the decade um, in relation to the financial crisis. And then there's been various kind of analysis afterwards looking into this um, uh, about, you know, compounding on the model, the sort of Swiss cheese kind of issues, but also just this breathtaking overconfidence. And um, I spent a lot of time, look, a lot of my best friends are economists, but it is pretty striking as a disciplinary, almost structurally set up to have some of these problems. So if you look at um, in many other disciplines, people think it's a really good idea to collaborate and get other views and put papers together. You ask economists, no, 57% of economists think there is no value whatsoever in collaborating and writing paper with another discipline. <laughs> now, I understand why they think that, you know, and it's good to be able to read equations and all the rest of it, but um, it, is, it is kind of sets you up structurally for a risk of a kind of, you know, a narrow th uh, frame of thinking, which is, is, is a problem, right? So, okay, what are we gonna do about it? I just got, you know, one or two last slides complete. So I'm not gonna go through all them, but um, probably because Farhan's gone through quite, Farhan's quite a few already, um, but I'll just pick up a few. And these are kind of broadly the colors map onto some of the things we've seen already. So allocation of attention, you know, we basically, our attention is dominated by the thing which is salient, and it's in the papers today. And, we have to work really hard institutionally to try and do something against that. So, um, of course, many uh, institutions have elements like this, so futures teams, where you're trying to work out the scenario, what do you think is going to go on, what are the other bigger drivers, et cetera. And um, one of the arguments about them is they're not very good sometimes at predicting the future, but at least what they do is they broaden your perspective about what else might happen in the world. And in generally, building things into your institutional practice which look for weak signals. You know, who is the person who is saying something in the corner? Um, that kind of very practical application. So, you know, a lot of us try and do this in a, in a meeting, get the more junior person to speak first. It's routine now, military practice in many settings, right? Because they may have a different perspective. Small uh, point by way is um, overconfidence occurs. The more senior you get actually gets worse. That's really, really worth remembering. Just for us over, actually, we did a session. We have this quaint thing in Britain where we bring together all the heads of departments once a week. And so we went through this. And one of them, we put up, didn't do it today, but this graph showing how the more senior we are, actually, the more this overconfidence becomes a problem. So it's a particularly good audience to raise it to our heads of departments. But partly it's because you don't get the challenge so much and so on. So, um, but that can be also true in other areas where governments aren't very good and public services at detecting where people said something went wrong, right? We should be really wanting feedback. We shouldn't be thinking, oh my God, it's another complaint. What is this person telling us about something went wrong Right? And then actually that's a really important signal. Um, confirmation bias type issues. Well, lots of things to do in this area. Um, one, I think, um, which we also kind of had a glance of, um, 
well, breakpoints, basically. Introduce breakpoints or opportunities. Otherwise, you get a momentum behind policy. And, of course, you've got a lot of sunk costs, etc. As much as you can in a process, you can try and literally build it in. You have a checkpoint, right? You will have a point at which we will re-review the legislation or this idea. You have green papers and white papers, ideally. So actually, one of the things it should be doing is a break point. Like, actually, it's a moment to say, it's OK, guys. We could get off this train if we need to at this point. Um, but without them, you just hurtle on um, forward. And the key point, of course, is to allow that minimal loss of faith. It's like, actually, this is a genuine consultation. We've looked at it. The evidence doesn't quite stack up, et cetera. Um, group reinforcement. Um, we touched on that. I won't go into much more detail, but lots of things around um, different kinds of diversity. I mean, remember, it's key result in the lab studies on this stuff. You get a different group, you know, group of friends together. They have a great time playing Cluedo-type games. Um, they're not very good at finding a solution, but they have a fantastic time. When you introduce someone else who's a stranger to the group, much more likely to get the right answer, but also have less fun. It's worth bearing in mind. There are some costs to diversity, um, but that still may be worth taking organizationally. Um, Intergroup opposition. We have a slight twist, which is more a hypothesis than anything. So um, red teaming, some of you be aware of it, or you assign an individual and you say, um, can you be a contrarian in this discussion, which can be pretty effective. One concern is our kind of group biases are so strong as soon as we said to Kate, oh, you know, you be the oppositional, you're like, oh, my God, she's completely gone native. We can put her in a different bucket. So if there's a case for doing it, we think actually deliberately do it with teams rather than individuals, right, so that actually it's, it's not so easy to dismiss when the alternative perspective comes through. Um, yeah, around optimism, bias, and so on, there's some quite specific things. So an example would be, I think some of you might know in detail, but done on economic forecasts, which is that um, on average, sometimes our views aren't far off, but... Uh, we're way overconfident. But if you give people some categories within which it's kind of reference points, like how sure are you, that you can stretch out people's answers, including in terms of their confidence estimates. And that can be, I think, pretty powerful. The last one, the kind of illusion of control. I think myself, look, I spent a long time working with senior policymakers. I worked six years with David Cameron, six years with Tony Blair, and so on and so on, and some others along the way. Um, and, um, you know, Politicians have a very strong sense of you know, the control of the world. They, they, they need it almost, right? They need to tell you, I'll go out there and make a difference. Um, and so what can you do about that? I remember an exercise we did years ago, actually. We, we did this um, piece of work with, we interviewed all of the cabinet and asked about their priorities, but also how much confidence they had they'd be able to make a difference on those issues. And we did it also with all the top of our senior civil servants. The biggest difference was just the politicians were so much more confident about their capacity to make a, a difference in the world, which is very laudable. But how can you do something about that? So if you go back to Chilcot, for example, one of the things you really need to do is you need to confront the possibility that the world has all kinds of exogenous shocks and it might not work the way you think it is. So you can work out your foreign policy all you like, but you know what? Other people have got different views on the matter and are going to try and frustrate you. So good scenario work, I think, genuinely can help with this a lot, right? Where you set out, these are other ways in which the world may end up, and whether you like it or not, how will you, your policy play it in such a, a circumstance? The last thing, at least, let me make a punt for, which is I think this stuff can get quite technocratic, but my own view, very strongly, is that when we think about nudging the nudges, a lot, one question is, well, you know, who the hell are we, really? And where are the public and where are the people that we are working with who are going to be affected by it? And I think this is especially true for a lot of the types of issues which behavioral science is used around. So lifestyle choices, et cetera, you know, obesity, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, actually, you're talking about lifestyle choices which individuals are making, and they are quite expert. People have got a lot of expertise about their own lives and strong views. So this is an example that we've done in Sydney um, with Fairfax Foundation, um, which was um, a bunch of young people actually asking them about their experience of social media and how they would like it to be shaped and so on. Well, by the way, they know a hell of a lot more about social media, frankly, than well, most of us looking around the room, certainly me. Um, but even you know, a 21-year-old, like if I think of my son, actually has, a lot, has missed a lot of these things which a 14, 15 year old are doing. I didn't know about floppy swappies myself until we got the feedback from this. If you don't know what they are, look them up. Actually, don't look them up on a work, uh, <laughs> on a work computer. Um, but the, the point is, for fundamentally, we need to have a way of building into our policy making um, the views of not just deliberation you know, for our experts, but genuinely 
putting it in who are the populations we're talking to and what do they think. And actually, that's one of the best ways we can answer a legitimacy challenge, which is sometimes what will happen is we'll show the evidence to a sample of the real people whose lives it's about and say, what do you think? And actually, the dynamic should be they're kind of giving us permission to make the change rather than just us telling them. So they should really be nudging the nudges. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you. Are we staying up? Okay. Thank you very much, David. And uh, we'll move to the panel now so that we can get questions from the full panel, but I will allow David to have the first question. So uh, feel free to come up and I will introduce you. They have to sit in their specific chairs. Uh, so I'll start with Kate Glazebrook. So uh, Kate Glazebrook is the CEO and co-founder of Applied. And this is the Behavioural Insights first uh, tech venture and was designed to actually uh, build a web platform to help people overcome biases in hiring and recruitment decisions. And prior to joining Applied, Kate was Principal Advisor and Head of Growth and Equality at the BIT team and has previously also worked for UNESCO in Southeast Asia and at Treasury where uh, we were colleagues before both of us ended up in behavioural economics. Uh, now, going to our other members of the panel, so David Yoakum, we now have two Davids on this panel. Uh, so David Yoakum is the director of the lab at DC. David was previously a founding member of the White House's social and behavioural sciences team and the director of its scientific delivery unit housed in the US General Services Administration. Under his leadership, the lab partnered with the Metropolitan Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia to implement an RCT examining the effects of wearing uh, body cameras for police. And David earned his PhD in psychology from the University of Arizona. And finally, I would like to introduce Ryan Batchelor. Ryan is the Executive Director of Public Sector Reform at the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet. And in this role, Ryan oversees public sector reform, outcomes, performance and delivery for the whole of Australia, uh, Victorian government innovation initiatives, including the Public Sector Innovation Fund, the Behavioural Insights Unit and the Victorian Centre for uh, Data Insights. Now, I'm going to go uh, stand here and uh, facilitate the panel's discussion. And uh, first of all, I have several questions for the panel, but I feel like David Halpin is owed a question. So who has a question for him? You don't have to. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take advantage of that small pause and ask my first question to the panel. Uh, and in answering it, I'll ask it to all of you and if you want to say a little bit more about your own interests and passion in this space. Maybe it's the obvious question, but I'd like to ask each of you, which do you see is the most obvious area you think we need to overcome behavioural biases in public administration? Who would like to start us off? Looking at me, so I, <laughs> I will. The issue of confirmation bias, or more generically, motivated reasoning, is I think the one that interests me the most in this space, just because it's a bias that's unique in that as you become more educated, more familiar with the policy space, higher IQ, et cetera, you actually can become more susceptible to it, which kind of makes sense. You get more skilled at reasoning in a way that's going to confirm whatever your motivated prior belief or value system is. And so it's also the one that can catch true experts the most off guard because they think I'm not going to fall prey to these things because of how much experience I've had. And so things that we can do institutionally to help people kind of bounce out of that, and I think it's a lot of the types of categories I've given examples of, the red teaming, some of the sort of forced consideration of alternative perspectives is where we need to go. But how often that is frequently done in government is where there's a bit of a sticking point. Even amongst people that know we should do this, government, the pace of it, the politics of it, make it very difficult to actually slow down and do those processes in a deliberate way, even if you know that you should. And so it's almost a sense of underestimating how big this bias is. It's maybe part of the reason of why we don't go out of our way to give enough time to it. So one of our biases is tripping us up on another bias, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what would you like to add to that? Well, so I would definitely agree with that, but in the interest of a, of a different one, I think, you know, present bias also affects us as policymakers. So we, it's come up a lot in, in the discussion so far. Like, do we have the time for really rigorous research to understand what works? And what are the risks associated with finding out that the thing we're really attached to doesn't work? 
and, and I think in government we're, we're frequently moving really quickly. I think, you know, David Gruen talked about this earlier. There's many things that impact a policymaker when they're mm -hmm. trying to make a decision and, and evidence is hopefully the dominant one, but it's not the only one. How do we create environments where, you know, I think, David, you sort of talked about this scenario building beforehand. So how do you have something useful to say when the moment is that the minister says we want something tomorrow? So you're not doing all of that work mm -hmm. that day in a hot state, but actually have something that you can offer that you had time for sort of deliberate reasoning. But I think, you know, how we, you know, in the Behavioural Insights team where I had the good fortune of working before I do what I do now, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to reframe the risk of experimentation. So the risk of doing, you know, finding out that the thing that you thought worked didn't work is some sort of future cost which might never be truly known, it might never be, ever be written up by an academic, whereas the cost of finding out right now that the thing your minister or, or your team is really proud of and would really love to roll out feels really um, salient and is real in the mm -hmm. present. So I think for policymakers, we always have to be thinking about what is the future cost that I'm massively discounting by not finding out something, it's the answer right now. Mm. And Brian, from your perspective, what would you see as the most obvious area? We've done a big piece of work recently on looking at our government's use of external advice. So where do we go out to market to get professional services or consultancy advice? And one of the big things that's come out through the, um, through the qualitative work, we did a big quant piece and then a big qualitative piece, uh, is people, the, the perceptions of credibility um, and unpacking the credibility heuristic that clearly exists in um, the way public servants um, view both their own, um, you know, this sort of confidence paradox in many respects that certainly our senior people think that, yes, they are the smartest people in the room because generally that's what everyone tells them and they um, have a sort of um, almost papal infallibility about their views on things. Um, but yet you go down and um, often people say, oh, I've got to get external firm X to validate or um, we need a, we heard a lot about branding. Um, we need someone's external um, branding on this report. Um, and I think there's a really interesting dynamic at play there to try and unpack why, um, what sources of external advice we put credibility in and why mm -hmm. and where they're prevalent. Um, Ron or advice. David, did you want to add anything? Uh, one thought is just, I mean, I, I think what's nudgeable to me is peer review. I mean, I think we, I don't know what it's like in the Australian government, but for us, every new project requires, you know, before sign off, you have to have peer review. Mm -hmm. And I think we could simply maybe let the task team leader, you know, choose someone and then have one chosen at random from a pool. And I think that would sort of like introduce, you know, some disciplining, some sort of, you know, breaking, you know, some diversity, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, that might help. And so I, I think that's something that's feasible that we could, I don't see why we don't do it. I mean, I, I I think risk taking is the large one, but I'm not sure what to think about that. So, to, to, I mean, to me, look, the biggest issue we've got is, is overconfidence from mm -hmm. start to finish. And it's not just the new things we're doing, it's the things we're already doing. We're overconfident. We have massive legacy services and activities, which we just assume that, of course, of course they have a big positive impact in the world. But actually, we've never checked, we've never tested. Um, and I think at least a partial response is, of course, you can do certain specific things inside a project. So um, pre-mortems, where you try and think through how it's going to go wrong. Um, so we might as well at least get that one on the table. It's pretty, can be uh, fairly effective. But otherwise, you have to build institutions. That's what it's telling us. Is you have to build institutions that do this better than we as individuals will do. So I mean, some of you know I serve as uh, National Advisor on What Works. We're building these institutions to build the evidence base outside of government deliberately so that we don't keep reaching into them and messing them up. Um, to build this kind of better evidence base. And I spent a lot of time actually in that role, which is not a million miles, very interwoven, interwoven with BIT type activities, BI that you're all doing, which is really trying to get public servants to embrace humility. And that's the, that is the starting point of any better method, because you have to realize you probably don't know what the hell's going on. And when you write your note, the chance are you don't know either. So most of the time you should be saying, really not sure how this will play out. Here's our best evidence, but we're gonna try out a few versions to see what's true. So the complicated bit and the difficult bit is not actually complicated methods and discontinuity designs or you know, getting your RCT right. It's the first step, which is humility. It's acknowledging that you don't know probably what is gonna happen. And that is, so you have, to, you have to work all the time with that and frankly, we have to build institutions that do it for us. Mm. Now That's, I'm gonna take, sorry. oh sorry David. I'm sorry, I just like this point. It's another place where I think the 
political institution does no favors for policymakers in that voters often reward whoever is coming out the most strongly saying this is definitely the thing that's going to work. You almost have to kind of oversell it a lot to get the political buy-in. I don't think it has to be this way. I think there is actually a political argument that I've, I've, we've made it a little bit in the district, but I'm hoping it spreads more around coming out saying this is the right idea, but not only that, I'm responsible enough to test it and I'll be the one to come back and tell you if it's not. And the other person who is saying he or she knows exactly what's going to work, it isn't going to test it. It's irresponsible in some sense. But this is just not the voting sort of norm. And I think you also need a little bit of over-optimism just to be <laughs> sane to work in government sometimes. <laughs> All right, questions from the floor. We've got uh, a couple down this front here. Hi, thank you, David and Varun, for your presentation, um, or presentations. Um, I think uh, your presentation showed there's a growing awareness of biases in government decision-making and policymakers, and you've both proposed, I guess, some suggest suggestions for mitigating it. I'm interested in, David, your idea of, I guess, building institutions to... Um, the grow our evidence base and develop humility. What would that look like, though, at a grassroots level and in our leadership? Um, and how can we, I guess, move towards a, a change where we are aware of our biases and we are actively implementing some of these strategies? I mean, look, I think a partial answer. We see it in well-functioning politics and democracy, you do see elements of it, right? So parliaments are, from the word, you know, parliament to speak, it, is um, you bring people together, and, and we know they're going to be biased. You're electing someone, and of course, lots of studies showing actually they are really, really biased, and they asymmetrically update and so on. But at least let's get two sets of them, maybe three or four, and have a good argument. And what you're hoping is that the net result institutionally is less biased. So um, I think we can do more and go further with those kinds of mechanisms. My own view is um, I, I'd love us to do far, far more of these deliberative mechanisms and more micro levels and buttress what we do in relation to policy. But it is an illustration of the issue. You don't try and say to every politician, no, you've got to be completely impartial. That's not, that's not how we built it. We built a system with a deliberate tension. And so that is a glimpse into the world a kind of, of institutions that you're going to need you know, with human beings. What a surprise. I'd like to ask Kate for a follow-up on this one because, Kate, when you're going to organisations and offering them applied, how do people experience the idea that their so-called merit-based recruitment processes might actually not be performing that well? Is it worth explaining Applied a little bit? Sure. Uh, so uh, Applied is a technology tool that tries to take a bunch of behavioural science evidence and data science and apply that to hiring processes. And it kind of came out of the fact that when we were in the behavioural insights team, we were reading all of these studies about how we were sort of probably, well, we were reading loads of studies that people systematically overlook people who don't look the part when they're applying for jobs. And we had the humility to think, it's possible we do the same thing <laughs> in the behavioral insights team. And so maybe we should be using some of these techniques in the way that we hire. So we started out um, very humbly, like taking CVs and, and, sh and sharpening out, my colleague Sam, who's, who's around, was sharpening out the names of people on CVs, thinking we know from loads of evidence that suggests that names sometimes distract people about the quality of a candidate. So why don't we remove them? And sort of eight to nine hours into the manual process of doing that, we realised like, this is really, really time consuming. And if we find this time consuming, we care about the issues and we know a lot about the evidence, uh, and we think this might be getting in the way of doing efficient processes, it's very likely that the vast majority of the rest of the population feel the same way. So we need some technology that will help us. And so that was the beginning of, of building applied. But, but Heather, you're right. You know, in, in so doing, it involves talking to loads of people in HR teams and saying, so we, we know there's this body of evidence out there that everything from confirmation bias to halo effect, so when you read a candidate and you love the first thing they've written, it's very likely that you'll be positively inclined to everything you see thereafter. Uh, or even things like how when the time of the day is that you, you score candidates might have an influence on how positively inclined you feel toward them. Or, you know, to, to your points earlier, we have these defaults in hiring processes, which is that we always rely on senior and ever more senior people to make these decisions without recognising that sometimes more junior people have useful, diverse, different perspectives to offer on what good looks like. Um, and this sort of weird default of seniority as being the only people we trust to make these decisions doesn't necessarily hold up. So we've tried to pack all of this into the product, but it does involve talking to people about, you know, and it feels a little bit when I first started talking to people like, you're biased, you are, you know, you're, you're making bad decisions here. 
Um, and increasingly, I think that's made easier by the fact that most people have started to hear about unconscious bias, and you can even look at Google Trends data that goes like this. And it's interesting, Australia, US, UK is where it's strongest. Um, I guess it follows the work of Beta and, 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 and the other teams. But increasingly, I think it's, it's the humility of the we. So the language we use in, in the Behavioural Insights team is always, we are, have these tendencies. And it's like, linguistically, it's really important to use those words because if we don't do that, it can instantly feel like a kind of defensive mechanism that we have. Um, so that's just some of them. And then the other ways that we do it is we just say, here, let me show you some data on how we in the Behavioural Insights team discovered that we had these same things. It's just a useful in for people to feel like it's okay to say, oh, it's possible it applies to me too. Further questions? One up there. Hi, Kate. My name's Simone Cunningham. I'm from the Attorney General's Department. Um, I don't know if you managed to catch Q&A last night, anyone last night. It was all about employment of disabilities, of people with disabilities. And it's less than 3% was the data that they provided. Um, I'm just wondering how your work is maybe improving the rates of uh, employment for people with disabilities. Uh, I, I had a look at my own website last night around if you're applying for a job in my own department. Question five on our list is do you have a disability that might um, change your ability to do this job? Um, first thing I'm going to do when I get back to work is to say, can we remove that question, please? Mm -hmm. But Because um, I don't think it's relevant. You wouldn't be applying for the job if you couldn't do the job. But I'm just wondering how we might use the things that you're looking at. Well, there's a lot of discussions about women and things like that in those sorts of spaces. But I think there are people who are in much greater need of seeking some support around bias. And I think disabilities might be one of those. Just interested in your question, thoughts. So I don't have great answers to this question, partly because, in my experience, when we talk about disability, we're actually talking about a really, really disparate array of things. So one of the things we've discovered, as a way of tracking diversity in hiring, we ask every candidate if they would like to divulge. They can independently on individual questions opt out of doing so, but if they would like to divulge diversity data, which includes asking them about disability. And I looked at the data recently, and it looks like people are least comfortable with giving even a yes or a no. They're more likely to prefer not to say on that question than, than other types of questions about even race, gender, ethnicity, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and I think partly it's because there are a lot of people who might think, I'm not sure whether what I'm experiencing counts in your definition of disability. So I think there's a really interesting and important conversation to go on there, which we'd like to engage with, the, with you know, agencies on how we do that better. The other piece is, I guess, inclusive design. So we spend a lot of time, we went and got an audit from the RNIB in, in the UK on how even the design of our technology is made as inclusive as possible for people with different types of disabilities. But that's still only one lens. So you can do that on screen readers and you can do that on drop down menus. I mean, there's actually some great web standards out there, but that doesn't account for a whole bunch of other disabilities that people might be facing. I would finally say, though, that the framing of these kinds of questions matters. So, you know, in the UK, there's a concept of disability confident employers, and they're using that as a kind of kite mark of saying, we believe we're the kind of organisation that's trying to do the right thing in these spaces and here are some of the standards we've met. And making that salient in a hiring process sometimes makes a huge difference to whether, as opposed to framing the question, please only apply, do you think you have a problem applying to this job, tick yes or no? It's, hey, we'd love to know the answer to this question because there may be some adjustments we can make for you at a later point in time and we want you to know we care about doing that. Um, and, you know, to to kind of the points made earlier, sometimes just the framing of the question will markedly shift people's perceptions of inclusivity there. We did some um, research last year on uh, community attitudes to the sharing of data within government um, for particular policy purposes and tried to break out different cohort groups as to whether um, they were more or less likely to want their information to be shared. Interestingly, we found that people with disability were amongst um, uh, the highest, the largest supporter group of, of their data sharing. Um, which we attributed more to a visibility um, frame that um, people want to be seen and noticed, um, particularly in large um, surveys so that, and then when we put the action frame around why it was the data sharing was occurring, you know, to improve services, those rates uh, went up considerably, which would reinforce that. Yeah. Yeah. To the rest of the panel, I'd like you to ask, I mean, the key around this is, if uh, this is becoming, going to be more accepted, what do you see each of your organisations contributing to it? So in order for 
uh, there to be a conversation about how everyone is biased and there are things we can do to overcome this. Someone like the World Bank has gone at first, right, and said, well, we definitely know we're biased and have applied going around saying, well, BIT was definitely biased. You know, what do, what do each of you think organisations and your organisations can do to kind of start this conversation? Varun, do you want to start? Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's... Um, it can be a systematic part of the work program, right? Sort of, you know, our, our survey was done in conjunction with the World Development Report 2015, which looked at behavioral insights as relevant for, relevance for development, but we could systematically think we need to keep exploring this, you know, sort of like a line item in the budget or something, mm -hmm. you know, to simplify yeah. it a bit. I mean, I, mean, I think in, on this question of humility, you know, and I think the, David put up the, the point about um, how policymakers will underestimate the effect of automatic, you know, or of uh, default options. Um, I think that's part of a larger question about will policymakers really be able to estimate the effects of any interventions? You know, I mean, I think we do all kinds of RCTs, but one of the things I'd be interested in doing to make it systematic is to sort of say, regularly ask our own staff, well, how do you think this is going to work? It's going to work? You think it's going to work? And everything that's out there, keep track of it. And then sort of see, one, you know, who's good at this and the style of like who's a super, super forecaster, but then also, you know, what, what helps? Like what, what kinds of, what reduces the, what improves the, the accuracy of your measurements? What increases humility? Because you can ask like you guys have done sort of for your confidence level about the estimates. I mean, I think that would be, if that were regularly done and we're doing, we do, you know, hundreds of RCTs, sort of we could sort of use that as a way to sort of like, begin to build in a process of thinking through your confidence and also your, um, how well you're using the data. Either David, would you like to comment on this one? I don't know how to, David, why? Right. David, how, H. Imagine, if you imagine us, our whole lives. <laughs> it's like, anyway, um, look, obviously we're gonna publish this report partly to kind of overse it. We're actually going to integrate it into, um, with the support of our cabinet secretary in Britain, we'll integrate it into the training of all civil servants. Mm -hmm to have a greater awareness of these things. Um, we'll see if that makes a difference. Um, within our own organization, I mean, Kate, of course, is, um, you know, applied is now separate, but it's a good example of us trying to apply this at home. We try and do other things. I mean, one thing is, um, for those even, you know, we try and be empirical. It's so hard not to get emotionally attached to a trial. And we talked about, we just, one actually earlier, it's fantastic bit of work going on here, in New South Wales on domestic violence. It's so, it's such a beautiful job. God, I hope it works. But I realize, you know, but actually that's a danger is that we get drawn into it, which is why it really matters that it's got Michael sat in front of you. So we, we're really quite brutal in keeping sort of separate, you know, Jack in the Box Michael to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to crawl all over us and kick the tires really hard. Because, you know, we're just so, the temptation must be so great on all of us. Even we're doing really empirical stuff. It's like, oh, you know, we sure, well, maybe that, that sample was a bit bad. We should remove that bit, you know. <laughs> well, no, that's never happened. And never happened. David. David, number two. I'll give a very just mundane type of tip, I think, for trying to approach a conversation, not only about bias, but often just trying to have discussions about what's not working in the first place. I think as scientists, the impulse is to sort of immediately jump to the problem. I mean, that's the frontier we work at. And in academic conferences, time is short, jump right to the problem, let's describe the problem, let's get right to it. And it's amazing how behaviorally unsophisticated that approach is in most day-to-day -day meetings where you're meeting someone in government for the first time or someone who works for a nonprofit, where you don't actually stop to acknowledge the really good work that has been happening there. And if you jump straight to the problem, it can really kind of short circuit the entire conversation from there. And so with, with our team, you know, we spend a lot of discipline making sure that if we're gonna go in and describe a problem we learned about in the data set, we go out of our way to also describe and sort of celebrate some of the things that we found that worked. And it's just a very subtle but simple basic human thing to do to establish trust. And like we don't do, we don't do that in our everyday reactions, right? If you wanna give some feedback to your wife or girlfriend or something, you don't open, you know, like, you, you know, you warm, you warm the room a little bit and talk about how much you love this and then that. Like, we need to do the same thing when we're pitching the science. I feel like if someone is tweeting this event, there have been some great quotes today. <laughs> okay, uh, now, we probably got just another five minutes, so how about one or two more questions? Uh, where are we going? Where's the mic? Oh, right. Uh, why don't you come down the front here, and then there was one at the back, and that might be it. Hi, my name's Kim Lowe and I work in the New South Wales Behavioural Insights Unit. 
Um, I guess we've talked a lot about overconfidence, and I think picking up on your point, uh, David, I'm wondering how the Dunning-Kruger effect... Sorry, David, number one or two, number two? <laughs> <laughs> middle, middle, yeah. middle David. Um, uh, around how the Dunning-Kruger effect plays out um, and whether or not there's any ways in which uh, we can try to overcome Dunning-Kruger as policymakers but also as behavioural science experts. Do you want to start with explaining the effect? I don't want to because I don't know the answer. <laughs> I feel like I'm embarrassingly showing my ignorance of which one this is. Uh, we're probably going to need the microphone back. I'm having a mental blank on as well. Panel members, can anyone remember? Phone a friend so here. Confidence for uh, expert, basically. Oh, just oh, how overconfidence, overconfidence varies by... So people who are yeah. experts. Yep, so absolutely, uh, just to repeat that. So when you're an expert, you're actually less confident and when you know very little, you actually tend to think you are an expert. And we really love to give labels to things that could be much more plain language. I, no, like you didn't come up with the label. Um, if somebody else has strong thoughts on this, that'll please join in and that'll give me time to make something up. Um, you know, if you think about the Philip Tetlock stuff is right, is that actually that, that isn't quite a, an accurate characterization, right? So experts themselves are rather importantly divided. Um, and so we have the Fox News type ones who are a fantastic TV and they are exactly as you describe. Um, but, uh, well, sorry, actually, how do you put it? You know, but the, um, but we, we, you know, we're supposed to try and, it is possible to, to be humble as well as being an expert. But what do you do about it? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I actually think everyone is so, it's such an over-dominant effect in general, our overconfidence, and um, it, it cuts in, in, in lots of different ways. So, I mean, one question is how do we help each other, I suppose? Um, that's the point about, um, Farron mentioned it also, is that um, we're, we're much, we're terrible basically about persuading ourselves about anything. Well, at least there's a hope in hell that we might be able to persuade someone else um, what's right or wrong. Um, and I guess the hope is also that people who have one of the early things you do, in fact, you see it in deliberative events, actually, is that you, you very rapidly go up on a learning curve. When you, re you meet other people who have different experiences and are different, you know, it's like, oh, my God, really? And, of course, it's done in a human way, not just in an intellectual manner. Um, so I think I'm hoping we're smarter as a group, despite groupthink, um, than we are individually. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I mean... There is a story, right, that this is sort of gendered too, right? Sort of you're asking if you're lost and asking for directions, don't ask a guy because they'll tell you the right answer even if they have no idea where the hell something is. Yeah, but a woman will be the one to sort of say, well, she'll only answer if she knows, right? And so, I mean, I think in organizational meetings, I mean, I think this is, it's a, it's a real phenomenon. And so I think, you know, um, shutting up the leader, you know, sort of that's sort of important when you're having a team meeting to have not that person because by nature is overconfident. And the other is to sort of before, I mean, just encourage people who might not want to speak to speak, you know, sort of like go around and say, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, before coming up with your summation. I think that's one approach. And see if I can redeem myself now. I mean, stepping back on just our difficulty of knowing where our expertise is, I mean, in, at the lab, we try to look for lots of places to facilitate just giving feedback. And so doing things like having everybody make predictions on how they think trials are going to operate and writing it down and then running the experiment and come back and doing things like that so you start to just better develop your intuitions about the limitations of your knowledge. And there's probably a hundred like little things like that that we could be doing to help sort of have real world feedback check our optimism. All right, one last question. There was uh, one on the back, that side up there. Yep, let's take that one. Thank you. Tarek Dale from the Australian Securities. An investments Commission, there's been a lot of discussion in social psychology and related fields about failures to replicate, where an effect will show up in a small sample but not a larger one, or just not be replicated in future studies. Any reflections from the panel on uh, how we as policymakers draw on an academic literature that's experiencing a crisis in confidence? Lots of willing uh, answers to that question. Some of, some of the tools, right? So meta-analyses are an obvious area, right? We can, there's, and the, the problem is that they're expensive and hard to do and they take a load of time, but the kinds of academics that spend their time trying to pull together a series of studies and say, what do we know in this space? Um, and they, by definition, they're 
almost always quite out of date. And that's one of the things that we just have to weigh. That's one of the balancing things that we just have to weigh. So in, in, in the space of job discrimination, Marion Bertrand, for example, has done an amazing piece of work trying to pull sort of 70 studies together in, into one piece of work and say, what do we think on balance is happening here based on, on, these, on these studies? So I think I would say, you know, as somebody who's a practitioner of most of this research, the more that we can get great researchers to, to spend time doing meta-analyses, and maybe they don't need to boil the ocean on large questions, but even in an area where we've seen a lot of different studies trying to tackle one particular part of the space and, and spending a bit more time there. I think I love the idea that we have, um, we don't always get to choose, you know, peer review. Um, and I would say the same thing for, you know, we haven't spoken much about this, but in the academic space, the kind of tiering of journals, I mean, nothing could be more arcane, I think, than this view that there are about five journals you ever trust and the rest are ba basically a wash. That's clearly not going to be the case for, for most of our research. And so I think for those of us who are practitioners, again, you know, trying not to get too mixed up, I think, in some of the, like, specifics of how academics measure themselves, but actually just saying, do we think this is a good study? Use your basic heuristics around, was it a good sample size? Is it, is it likely to have external validity? You know, how well do we think they specified the questions? You know, there are some basic things that probably help you to get there without getting paralyzed, because I think this replication question has led a load of people to feeling like, oh my God, we know nothing, um, which is clearly not going to be the case. And also we know that, um, that, that jurisdictions are very good at copying. Um, that, that the patterns of adoption of similar policy solutions from jurisdiction to jurisdiction actually can occur quite fast. Um, so in some respects, some policy makers or decision makers can actually use some of those mechanisms and say, well, well yes, we think it's probably good enough and we'll, and we'll keep going and roll out. So um, we shouldn't, I don't think, I don't think decision makers and policy makers um, can ever feel like they're being um, paralysed by waiting for the evidence because life's not going to do that for you. Um, you've got to figure out how much is good enough and, and push through. Just like Marty, so which is um, that our biases are everywhere, including the interpretation of this particular issue. So, um, so it's being used asymmetrically as a problem. I mean, look, we kind of journalists just talk about it. We know we need larger sample sizes, multiple replications, more homogeneous populations, let's look for heterotopic effects, etc. But actually, one of the dangers is exactly as Kate said, you know, is that for some people, like, oh, yeah, I knew that RCTs are crap. I can get rid of those after all. You know, it's like that shouldn't be the interpretation um, of, of where we go from it. But that's definitely a bit of that going on. Um, so we should be wary of it, I think. Mm. Just a couple, couple of thoughts on this. One is, um, so I think, I mean, a lot of it is driven by p-hacking, right? And so does it have a pre-analysis plan, right? I mean, that's a good rule of thumb, I think, in sort of deciding whether to use something in policy, you know? And the other is, um, does it work in the field, right? Because ultimately, I mean, you might, just to pick a controversial one, a power pose might be powerful, you know, in a particular circumstance, but has it actually improved test scores, you know, or, or something? Like, that's another little rule of thumb um, to sort of, that I, I personally use. All right, I'm going to leave it there, given that Varun opened to make sense that he is the last speaker to close. So will you join me in thanking all of our panel members today? Thank you.